that running? Can you click in the video there? And then hide the, uh, just uh, that, yep, and then hide the little hand there. The little hand of, yep, thank you. Oop, just like that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, PowerPoint. Click in there once more. All right, we'll just do it without that. Um, so, bonjour, Genève. Um, I'm going to go a few minutes long, so you can hate me for a lot of reasons, but not that one. Um, so I'm going to start with a prologue, um, uh, which is uh, a presentation that I gave about a year ago. And uh, that presentation was a, a meditation, a love letter, kind of a eulogy for uh, Lower Manhattan, for the so-called financial district, um, for the period in which the financial district of New York City was built on information and the people, like the flesh and blood through which that information was carried, and how it's not really like that anymore. So in that presentation, in this presentation, it opens with the idea of how cities had to learn how to listen. Cities had to learn how to listen because they knew, between the First and Second World War, they knew that planes would come. And they knew that the planes coming were not going to be good news, and that's why they developed radar. And because they developed radar, that's why they developed stealth. Right? And stealth uh, was basically this dream uh, that emerged from this, the idea of moving through the earth invisibly, the idea of being able to travel without leaving any trace at all. And of course, that doesn't really work out. Uh, that story doesn't end well. It ends uh, in 1999 when one of the so-called invisible uh, stealth fighters, the F-117, was shot down over Serbia, uh, which uh, was never supposed to happen. This story ends, like a few stories I'm going to tell you today, in a crash. Um, and uh, so it is that that was never really brilliantly explained, um, but I found myself about a year and a half ago on a plane uh, talking. To, uh, you're just going to see images of birds uh, uh, in the sky for the, the rest of the presentations uh, today, by the way. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I, was on a, I was on a flight with a guy, a uh, guy sitting next to me. Turned out to be, uh, uh, he grew up in Hungary during the Cold War, a mathematician, and we got to talking. And I said, so what did mathematicians do uh, in Hungary uh, during uh, the Cold War? And he said, well, I, I worked on stealth. And I said, so you were making stealth? And he said, no, I was, I was breaking stealth. And I said, so how'd you, how'd you do that? I did hear about that. But had, and he goes, well, do you know how stealth works? And I said, yeah, I, I kind of do. And so this is an oversimplification, which is part of my job. But just to explain it broadly, you can't, of course, make the plane disappear, right? the radar doesn't just go through it. What you do is you take the big thing, the bomber, right? And you, one way or another, you break it up into a lot of little things, right? If you can make the big thing look like a lot of little things, like, I don't know, birds, let's say, right? Then radar becomes useless, because if your radar was tuned to see every bird in the sky, that's all you'd ever see, right? So the way to make something disappear in that area uh, is to make the big thing into a lot of little things. And I said, that's my understanding of it. And he said, yeah, that's true, but that's only if you're looking at it like that. And I said, so what did you do? And he said, well, I made a black box that was looking for electrical signals. And he said, and if we saw a big electrical signal moving through the sky and nothing on radar, we thought, probably an American bomber. True. Uh, and I said, so that's cool. So you built the black box that destroyed 60 years of research into American air dominance. Like, what's your, what's your act two? Like, where do, you, where do you go from there? And he said, um, uh, uh, financial services. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I've, I've heard about those. Those have been in the news lately, actually. Um, can you move the, the cursor, the hand off, please? Um, uh, so, yeah, so the... the um, the financial services have been in the news, um, and this was sort of his act too. And I, and I said, oh, so, so what is the black box in financial services? And he said, well, it's funny that you asked that because it's called black box trading, right? And it emerged because of the need within financial services where, let's say you're a big bank and you're moving a million shares of something through the market, right? If you just do that, if you just try to move them, it's like playing poker and opening all in, just saying, like, I've got a great hand. You know, right? And that's no good, right? That's no good if that's uh, uh, the, the kind of poker that you play. And so they've developed algorithms, the banks have, 
uh, uh, that basically break up the big thing, the million shares, into a lot of little things. 100 shares here, 100 shares here, 100 shares there. And they do everything they can to make that appear as random as possible so that nobody understands that there's a million shares, a bomber moving through the sky. Right? But of course, it's just math, and math can be broken with math. So there's a lot of other algorithms that are like shooting out to try to find 100 shares here, 100 shares here, and that understand that this is how the market's going to move. Right? So this is what's happening on Wall Street. 70% of all trades on Wall Street right, are either an algorithm trying to appear invisible or another algorithm trying to find that invisible algorithm. Right? That is where we live uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as global financial entities. Um, and I said, so, so how, do you, how do you do that better or worse? And he said, well, if you're doing this thing called high-frequency trading, where you're trying to sort of like find that thing moving through the sky, he said, you've got three things on your side, right? You can have better algorithms, you could have a better computer, but really, it's the network that determines it, right? Because if you can shave a few milliseconds off, that's millions, possibly billions of dollars, right? So how do you do that? Right? How do you shave a couple seconds off on your network speed? Well, you get closer to the internet, right? which everybody thinks still, appropriately, is this kind of distributed broad network. But it's not really, really that distributed. It comes up, in Manhattan's case, at 60 Hudson Street, into this thing. It's called a carrier hotel. Right? And that specific place is where all the pipes come up. And if you're sitting right on top of that, you enjoy, effectively, a zero millisecond delay. Right? as opposed to these losers down on Wall Street, right, who have their algorithms like 20 blocks away, which is like two milliseconds, you know, if it's traveling through the pipes. And those two milliseconds are millions or tens of millions of dollars, right? So that's why you see weird real estate spikes in Manhattan now, because the criteria are not obvious to humans because they're not the ones that we use, being close to the carrier hotel. Right? And that's why if you're an architect in New York, Tokyo, Frankfurt, you might find yourself being asked to work on buildings that have no obvious correlation to anything else in particular, and being asked to lay steel down on the floor and remove all the furniture, because the servers that are going to go in there are much heavier than the people that used to work there. Right? So let's be clear that like buildings and cities are changing, are structurally changing around the needs of a bunch of algorithms that have no agenda that would be of much correlation to anything you were happen to be doing in that space, right? And that, you know, to borrow from uh, uh, Neil Stevenson, you know, effectively, New York City is being optimized to run like a motherboard, right? That New York City is being sort of like smoothed into the performance characteristics of a microchip. Right? And you, all of you, are just loitering. Right? Because whatever it is you're doing in that valuable space, inch for inch, pound for pound, dollar for dollar, couldn't possibly be as valuable as what a computer could do with that same office space. This is uh, the monster, the knife, carnival, the Boston shuffler, Castle Wall, Twilight. Chapter two. Um, so the reason why I wanted to explore this was when I was at my father's radio station. I grew up in the radio business. Uh, I'm actually a third uh, generation DJ. My grandfather was an AM DJ. My father was an FM DJ. I've also done some uh, college radio. And I also just DJ out in clubs and such. Uh, but I went to my father's uh, radio station uh, when I was, it was a sick day, and I was, you know, I went into the DJ booth and I asked the, the, the DJ there, I was like, hey, you know, wh what are you going to spin next? You, you know, I looked up to this guy and he's like, sorry, kid, you know, it's not like that anymore. And he points over to the corner of the room and there's a dot matrix printer printing out the playlist for what to play. And this was in the late 80s. Um, and this has continued today through things like uh, Pandora, Last FM, and... So... I teach at NYU, and this was about a week after I gave that first part of the talk. And I realized, all of a sudden, watching Winslow present, really brilliant student at NYU, watching him present and talk about what happened to radio, you know, in front of his eyes, right, where suddenly what we listened to on the radio was coming out of a printer at the side of the room rather than out of his dad's hands. And I realized, like, 
this isn't about financial services, right? This is about something much broader, right? Much deeper, right? And that if you start pulling on that, on that red thread, you realize that those algorithms that determine market value and what your pension is at, that determine the real estate of Manhattan, that determine the radio, also determine a lot of other stuff. Like a lot of other stuff in our everyday lives, right? They determine what we hear. It determines how those songs are made, right? What they sound like, right? What we watch, what we're going to see in the movies, what we're not going to see in the movies, what we think about them even, right? What we read, the titles for what we read are algorithmically evaluated and determined, right? Who we're matched with if we go online to get matched with somebody. What's, what do we call news? Who gets arrested is algorithmically determined these days. There's something called razor to do that, uh, Comstat, what happens to those people, um, what we drive, how we get there, all these things, even what we, ink, what, uh, what we eat and what we drink even have algorithmic effects being applied to them right now. There's three problems with this, or three obvious ones, three we can talk about right now, right? The first one is opacity, the second one's inscrutability, the third one is darker and a little bit harder to describe, I don't even know what to call it yet. The first one is easier to talk about, and it's the opacity. So this is the latest in elevators. I don't know how many of you are like big elevator enthusiasts or users, probably many. Um, but you know, elevators in their conventional construction, extremely inefficient, right? Not at all how a computer would design them, right? Because it's a bunch of people, and they, some of them get into this one, some of them get into this one, and then these ones want to go here, and these ones. And so sometimes it takes five minutes to get there, and sometimes it takes one minute there. And there's an algorithm called a bin packing algorithm that says, actually, if you know where everybody's going to go, you can load up these different bins differently uh, to get people to their destination quicker. All you have to do is have everybody announce to the computer before they get in the elevator where they're going and put them in the elevator and then just take them there, right? And all of that's fine, uh, uh, except that all of a sudden you're in a metal box that, unlike any other elevator you've ever been in, has no buttons. No buttons to press except for one. And it says stop. All right? And if the effects of algorithms are somehow abstract to you up until now, they become more concrete when you're in a sealed metal box with nothing to press except that button. These are, uh, these are some algorithms that sit inside your first world home. Uh, these are uh, cleaning robots. Uh, the top one is the Roomba. Uh, below that is one called the Neato. This is a time exposure, uh, time length, whatever, something shot of, uh, uh, of the two robots. And it shows you how they clean your house, right? And you can see, like, they basically, it's basically the same robot, it looks like, right? They do basically the same thing, clean your house, right? but they're not really doing the same thing at all, right? Because these are different behaviors inside them, and those behaviors are algorithmically determined. And there's something about the Roomba that's unsettling, right? To me, right? And uh, as my friend Russell said, it's like it's sort of uncomfortable to be in the room with one because it's not behaving like a human, right? The Neato kind of cleans like you would clean, right? But the Roomba is like off on its own thing. It's not, it's no longer behaving in the human world with any kind of human dialect, right? And that opacity is strange. The, 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 the inscrutable quality of it, right, is, is that we interrogate these algorithms. These are things that humans write but can no longer read, right? So this is a specific type of algorithm called a, a genetic algorithm. And just to compress it really quickly and poorly and oversimplifying, that's what I do, uh, 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 genetic algorithms basically say in this one, the genetic algorithm is, we've got to get this thing from point A to point B, and there's some weight, and there's some wheels with motors on them. You figure out how to do it. And the computer's like, okay, we'll just run this. And, you know, it doesn't even know that the wheels go on the bottom, right? And you watch this, and it's like watching a puppy in the snow. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of like sad, you know? And it's sort of like, like, just put the wheels on the bottom. It's absolutely obvious, right? <laughs> Uh, and it's so silly, but what it's doing is it's, it's trying and failing, and when it succeeds a little bit, it takes that thing that succeeded better than the others, and it weights the next generation based on how that one did, and it introduces some mutations, and then it introduces some mutations, and then it takes those, and so on. And if you let that run for about an hour, you get this, don't you? You get this, and then it's not really that cute anymore. 
right? Then it's actually a little bit weird and scary, right? Because the computer figured out how to get, how to build a car, basically, right? How to build the most efficient car. But it didn't even know that the wheels are how it moves, right? And it can do that, you know, and it can do that in ways that don't feel like or seem like the way that we think, right? They don't, they don't relate back to how humans think. They have something to do with how humans have evolved, but that's different, right? And there's something about that that's just a little bit unnerving. This is, um, this is Core War. Um, I don't know how many of you are big players. This is a video game that started in 1984. This is a programmer's game. This is a game where two programmers design algorithms, pit them against each other. Only one of them is going to win. And you can see this is uh, uh, Dwarf Scout versus Little Factory. And you can see here comes Dwarf Scout. You following this? Right? Here comes Dwarf Scout. Oh, and it's Little Factory wins. This is a big victory for Little Factory in that one. Um, and this seems uh, absurdly abstract, of course. Right? Like it's not... It's not like Monopoly, right, where it's Atlantic City. But what I would argue is, is that this game is in no way any more abstract than, I don't know, for example, your pension on the stock market, which is being operated on by algorithms that are the genetic descendants of uh, Dwarf Scout and Little Factory, right? That these, uh, 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 the monster, the knife, uh, the carnival, these are algorithms that have been discovered in the stock market by a company called Nanex. Nanex didn't make the algorithms, they found them, right? They're really good at this stuff, it's all way beyond me, but they're extracting these from otherwise opaque behavior. It's like they're looking at the Roomba cleaning the room, and they're like, okay, it's actually doing this, except that thing is all of your investments, right? And these are the algorithms that are running through them. And Nanex did something strange. They did something magical by actually being able to find them running in there, right? Like somebody running code on your computer when your computer is the economy of the United States. Um, but they also did something curious, which is that they gave them names, right? This one is Twilight. And all of this in a way, it's easy to say, like, okay, yeah, so this is some of the stuff that Darwin talked about, and da-da-da-da-da. Um, but really, what's interesting is his cousin, Galton, right? Francis Galton, who mixed bag on Galton. Not all amazing stuff came out of his mouth. But uh, he spent a lot of time with sweet peas, and some interesting things came out of that, right? What he was trying to do was to figure out how do you understand, if you've got like all this unstructured data, how do you begin to make sense out of that? And that's regression analysis, and that's a whole other... Well, something, um, but what's important is, is that in the, in the seeds of that, uh, uh, you find a lot of contemporary algorithms working. And if you take that further, if you take that further into the field from the sweet peas to like the grapes, then interesting things start to happen, right? Because the amount of data that's being produced is so immense. So you could be an economist at Princeton, Orly Ashenfelter, and take all of the data that grapes are producing, and if you know how to run it, well, you can tell the same way the computer was able to figure out to build a car to get up that hill, it can figure out, is it going to be a good wine from Bordeaux this year before the wine is made, right? And that's kind of a big deal if you are, for example, Robert Parker, the emperor of wine, a man who makes his living and many other people's living telling you what's good wine based on his mouth, right? Based on what he thinks, right? Because all of that must somehow be reducible down to some data that exists in the world that we can extract. And so it is that Orly Ashenfelter and, uh, and Robert Parker you know, represent these two different approaches. And the idea that taste could be algorithmically mined or determined even, right? Because you know, it's like if Robert Parker gives it another couple extra points, that's millions of dollars, move hands on that, right? But that may not be what the math says. The math may say something else. And math affects taste and preference, right? You see this in Netflix, right? 60% of all movies that are rented from Netflix are rented because Netflix recommended that movie to rent to you. Think about that. 60%. What did you do before that? I don't remember, right? Like, how did you know what you wanted to watch before something told you that that would be good to watch because we kind of know you? And so they did an okay job, but they had the... the, the uh, uh, algorithm they were using was called Cinematch and it had a, a root mean square error of 0.95. What does that mean in real terms? It means um, it's four stars 
but it might be more like three stars or five stars. Mm, not perfect, right? Um, and so they basically said, look, you guys can do it better, do it. And so they introduced a competition, and now, just the same way you had Carnival, just the same way you had The Knife and The Boston Shuffler, people started to make new algorithms for Netflix. Gravity, Pragmatic Chaos, Dinosaur Planet. Pragmatic Chaos won, by the way, and reduced the real mean, uh, root mean square error to 0.85. And one of the ways they did that was by taking into account how crappy the human brain actually operates. Because if you, if you look at the human brain and you say to somebody, that movie that you rented, uh, uh, the, the movie that you rated uh, four months ago, can you rate it again? The root mean square error of that, the human brain, is about one, right? You gave it four stars a month ago, you gave it three stars now, right? The really good algorithms are the ones that can actually get in and find that and work with the meat, the weakest part of this whole equation, which is the human brain, right? But so what if... Never mind the taste, never mind the recommendations for the things that have been made. What if, like Orly Ashenfelter, who can determine whether the wine is going to be good, what if you could tell not which movies have been made that you like, but what movies should be made that you might like? Well, that's a company called Epigogics, right, out in California. And that's their job. And they will feed a script into some kind of computer, and it takes about a day, and they will tell you whether that's an $80 million movie, a $200 million movie, $30 million movie, and they're pretty good at it, right? And what happens, right? So now you've got algorithms that are determining what movies are going to get made, and you've got algorithms that are determining whether those movies were any good, right? And actually, who's the user in this scenario? Maybe it's not you. Just put that out there, right? And what is the long-term effect of this kind of production and consumption all happening at an algorithmic level, right? The Galton called it regression for a reason, which is that it, it regresses towards the mean, right? And it produces a kind of monoculture, right? It produces a monoculture where everything starts to smooth out. It's perfect and it's endless, and that's fine until it's not. That's fine until the stock market loses 10% in 11 minutes, right? Because the 70% of the market that was trading algorithmically encountered something that it wasn't supposed to and started trading uh, Procter & Gamble at a penny and Accenture at $100,000 a share. No offense to Accenture, but that's not a human error, right? And, you know, and the fact is, is that when that happened, nobody can even agree on what happened, right? It's so dense. It's like the Roomba in the room. It's like we made it, but we can't read it. We wrote it, but we can't read it. And the question is, what will happen when that flash crash happens in the entertainment industry, right? What happens if you have computers that determine what movies get made and which ones were good? What does a flash crash look like in Hollywood? Maybe it's already happened. How would we know, right? What does a flash crash look like in a computer dating site, right? What does a flash crash look like in the wine market? What does it look like in the criminal justice system? Chapter three, and believe me, this part's quick. Virgo, Gemini, Pegasus. My friend Russell said it last night. There's no astrology, or there's no astronomy column in the newspaper, right? It's astrology, right? We don't look at the stars and say, it's so fascinating, right? The way that Mars has arced. We tell it in terms of stories, right? That's how we understand the world. And the thing that will save us is the human capability to actually turn away from facts, to ignore, to be oblivious to facts and data, and just tell whatever it is that's going to make sense to ourselves, right? Wall Street does this all the time. It's an unlikely neighborhood to find hope for this, but it does it all the time. That's what happened, right? You had, a, you had all these companies that were, the numbers came in and said, these mortgages could never succeed. And they sold them anyway, and then they shorted the ones because they knew they wouldn't succeed. It wasn't about what the numbers said. It was about what the humans said, regardless of what the numbers said. And our capacity for that kind of distortion, that willful distortion, is endless. We can outdo any algorithm with the kind of willful distortion that we engage in every day. Not just on Wall Street. I mean, every one of us. The last part of it is this other lesson that you can learn from Wall Street, which is the ones who are sort of picking up and leaving in their own way, right? To say like, you know what? The whole market's all messed up because you've, you've got all these algorithms this way, you've got all these algorithms coming up this way. How about we just trade outside of that, somewhere like, I don't know, Geneva. And you say, you know what? We're gonna move a million shares and we'll do that with a couple phone calls. We'll work it out. 
will do this outside of the world in which algorithms are operating and grabbing at them, right? And that practice, uh, uh, which again, I've oversimplified, is called dark pools, right? And these dark pools in which huge amounts of liquidity are moving around uh, outside of the realm of the algorithms that we built to produce them and destroy them, right? That impulse by the financial markets is actually something to look to, right? Because the question is, because I have no idea whether the dark pools are really good or bad for the market, not my job, right? But the question is, this impulse to take things out of the algorithmic areas that we've produced that seem relentless, right? What does the dark pool of Hollywood look like? What's the dark pool of music, of real estate, of wine? That's what I'm really interested in, and that's what I hope that we have, like, here today. Thanks.